Well, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you our next speaker, Father Emery de Gaulle, who was born in Chicago, and so is an American, technically, but raised in Gior, Hungary, and Munich, Germany. He spent a great deal of time overseas. He's a Catholic priest of the Diocese of Eichstadt, Germany. Father de Gaulle studied Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant theology at the Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich, and he earned its PhD in dogmatic theology from Duquesne University in Pittsburgh. He serves as chair and professor of Catholic dogmatic theology at the University of St. Mary of the Lake, Mundelein Seminary. Father de Gaulle has directed over 25 doctoral theses and is published in six different languages. Um, so again, like with our last speaker, just a testimony to the, the wide relevance of his work. Among others, he is author of The Theology of Pope Benedict XVI, The Christocentric Shift, published in 2010, and Lord, I Seek Your Countenance, Explorations and Discoveries in Pope Benedict XVI's Theology, published by Emmaus Academic in 2018. His areas of concentration are medieval thought and resourcement theology with particular attention to Saint Anselm, uh, an often understudied figure among the doctors of the church. He's also a specialist in Ratzinger studies and Mariology. He's a member of the Academy of Catholic Theology and the Pontificia Acad Academia Marianum Internationalis. Please join me in welcoming Father de Gaulle. I thank you for your very kind introduction. Um, I thank Stephen Hipp for proposing this topic. I should like to express also my gratitude for being here. Um, it's, it's my first time at Christendom College. Um, the church is really spectacular. The campus is beautiful and the faculty is most impressive. So in, in a sense, especially now in springtime, it is a felicitous symphony of truth, goodness, and beauty, the transcendentals that lead us to God. Mary and the Blessed Trinity. Is this a topic that can be discussed? Um, let me introduce this with a tangent. Um, in the 18th century, there was a competition between Jesuits and Dominicans in Vienna, who is the better homilist. And, <laughs> and once a Jesuit would preach at a Dominican church and then vice versa, and only on the pulpit would they discover the topic. And the Dominican ascended the pulpit and discovered uh, the topic the first thoughts of our Lord Jesus Christ in the crib. And, he's, and it began by uh, the J Dominican saying, our Lord saw uh, light, he looked to his left, he looked to his right, and he saw an ox and an ass. And he said, wisely, I see, I see, this is the Society of Jesus. <laughs> so, of course, we want to say the relationship between our Lord Jesus Christ and the Jesuits is not analogous to this relationship of the Blessed Trinity with Mary. <laughs> right? The divine ineffable aseity is quite different, and Our Lady, as Mother of God, and the Immaculate Conception is also different. The noted Mariologist Michael O'Carroll wrote, on the day of the Annunciation, the Holy Trinity entered mankind in a way hitherto unexampled. The Father sent the Son. The Son was made flesh by the power and operation of the Spirit." Unquote. If it is true 
that every human being is created in the image and likeness of the triune God, then, a fortiori, this must apply also to Our Lady. In the order of salvation, this universally latent human Trinitarian relationship is fully actuated in Mary. Some works of Christian art depict Mary and the Trinity, such as Luca Giordano's The Holy Family Has a Vision of the Symbols of the Passion, 1660, or Stefan Locher, The Presentation in the Temple, 1447, or Ambrogio Lorenzetti, The Presentation of the, in the Temple, 1340, Jan van Eyck's The Annunciation, 1425 maybe, the master of Saint Verdania, the Annunciation, 1410, and Penturicio's The Annunciation, 1501. Numerous paintings are showing Mary's coronation as Queen of Heaven in the presence of the Blessed Trinity. The contemporary problematique, a robust Christocentric theology, is joyfully mindful of human beings capable of relating to the Blessed Trinity. To a mainly anthropocentric direction of theology, however, argues the Catholic theologian and Sacred Heart priest Karl Wittkemper, it may seem superfluous, even detrimental, to a minimalist understanding of faith, to speculate on the relationship of the Mother of God to the Blessed Trinity. Such theologians fear that the true humanity, the real humanness of Mary, could suffer damage. Some also fear it is not only tasteless, linguistically ris risky, and an unreasonable transgression to place Mary in proximity to the triune God, but also theologically dangerous, ecumenically insensitive, and an outright untenable exaggeration when emphasizing Mary's sublime majesty and dignity. Our Lady would be moved too close to God so that in reality she would seem no longer to remain his creature. But here there is the danger of too little veneration for Our Lady, of which Vatican II warns. Theologians are to be to be to beware not only of false exaggerations, but also of too little speculative reading into the spirit. If theology is the speech of God and about God, then Mariology too, without leading to Mario, Mario Latry, approaching even divinization of Mary, a la the Mariamites, must as part of theology, investigate and present Mary's relationship to God, who stands before us as a threefold one, just as it is legitimate to consider the relation of the ensouled human soul in general to the Trinity. Whoever does not consider this aspect of the mystery of Mary facing the triune God cannot understand the special position of Mary in the history of salvation of humankind. He also renounces the possibility of the peculiar being of the three divine persons, the relationship to the world and their world action as a cert at a certain point of the history of salvation. To a more vivid conception, it deprives the religious imagination of meditating on the salvific actions of the threefold God, which appear in unique concreteness in the person of Mary. She is the paradigm of God's personal self-communication to man, and thus contributes to the illumination of the mystery of the Trinity and of the human being as person. Here, this, the aspect of servant position of the Mother of God towards the Trinitarian mystery of God as a whole ev evidences its spiritual richness. Thus, 
it is not surprising that comparatively recent ecclesiastical pronouncements speak positively about Mary's relationship to the Trinity and her resulting majesty and dignity. The Second Vatican Council in Lumen Gentium 53 records, quote, redeemed by reason of the merits of her son and united to him by a close and indissoluble tie, he is endowed with the high office and dignity of being the mother of God, which, by which account she is also the beloved daughter of the Father and the temple of the Holy Spirit. Unquote. In number 54, he is referred to as who occupies a place in the church which is the highest after Christ and yet very close to us. Number 63 of the same document continues. She is united with her son, the Redeemer, and with his singular graces and functions. The Blessed Virgin is also intimately united with the Church. Number 66 of the same document reads, Exalted above all angels and men, Mary intervened in the mysteries of Christ and is justly honored by a special cult in the Church. 2.0, Mary and the Trinity in Sacred Scripture. The threefold designation of Mary, which we encounter in various forms and tradition, is grounded, or at least hinted at, in the Annunciation Pericope. The angel greets Mary, the Lord is with you. You have found favor with God, parato theou. You will bear a son. He will be great and son of the Most High. Hios Hephistu. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Therefore, the child will be called Son of God. Elizabeth greets Mary. Who am I that the mother of my Lord, he meter tu curiumu, should come to me? The conception and birth of the Messiah is announced. Is God spoken of here only in a general sense? And is the Messiah as the Son of God referred to only in a broader sense? Or is God here the first person in the Trinity and the Messiah, the second person, the true, real Son of God in the metaphysical sense, and therefore the second person in the Trinity? It is especially significant that Elizabeth, enlightened by the Holy Spirit, greets Mary as the mother of her Lord, Curios. Curios, in the Greek Septuagint, as we know, refers to God, the Tetragrammaton. From a purely exegetical point of view, the biblical texts do not yet clearly speak of the first and second persons of the Trinity. However, if the overall tenor of Luke's Gospel and the traditional understanding are considered, it must be admitted that in this context, God the Father and His only begotten Son are referred to. Is there in this context also mention of the Holy Spirit as the per third person of the Trinity? Verse 35 reads, The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. In the Greek original text, the article is missing from both pneuma hagion as well as dynamis hyphostu. The literal translation is the Holy Spirit and power of the Most High. Heinz Schumann argues pneuma hagion with the dynamis of God, because of the parallelism and because of the lack of a definitive article, will work the miracle in her, the creative omnipotence of God with whom nothing is impossible. Exegetes point to a parallel text. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Exodus 40, 34. Here, the point de départ 
is found in the traditional explanation which has been consolidated through the subsequent centuries, taking Holy Spirit as a personal designation for the third person in the Trinity. Indeed, here the first New Testament suggestion of the Trinity is present. From this arises the closest relationship of Mary to the persons of the Holy Trinity. At the beginning, to the Son as his mother, and through him to his Father and to the Holy Spirit as well. Mary's relationship to the Holy Spirit, however, cannot be understood as an immediate personal relationship to one person alone, but only as one of appropriation, because according to the pericopretic principle that all outward works of God are common to the Trinity, the effect of the incarnation of, of the Logos is also common to the persons of the Trinity, that is, the communicatio idiomatum. A side question, did Mary hear in the angel's message an intimation of the mystery of the Trinity, that Mary grasped this mystery of Jesus with ever greater depth, especially after Pentecost, is probably not doubted by anyone. It would certainly be an uplifting thought, as Mary is chosen from the highest, for the highest task that could ever be given to an earthly woman. She is the first and best redeemed, the most graced, and stands at the threshold to the New Testament. Thereby, she could have gained insight into the deepest mystery of inner divine life so that she could also have become aware of being not only the mother of the Messiah, as described in the Old Testament, but also the mother of the true Son of God. The Grand Seigneur of Mariology, René Laurentin, who died almost 100 years old in 2017, tries to show that Mary recognized from the angel's salutation the true sonship of the Messiah. He does not consider this as certain, but as la meilleure probabilité du point de vue exegétique, the, the better probability from an exegetical, exegetical point of view. But beyond that, did Mary also recognize the true divinity of the Holy Spirit as the third person in the Trinity. From a purely exegetical point of view, this can hardly be decided, but perhaps more general considerations will help. The noted 20th century theologian Heinrich Maria Köster, he died in 1993, had argued, quote, one can certainly ask to which degree this message of the angel, which contained a suggestion of the Trinity, was understandable for Mary. Only historians will set the degree of such knowledge exceptionally low. One may ask, however, whether then this revelation was still meaningful, since it obviously should inform about its role, and whether these words should not inform about, similar to other revelations of God, the power that they bring about, the knowledge which they designate, especially since it is also the task of the angels to support the intellect of the human being to whom they impart revelatory knowledge. And here he quotes St. Thomas Aquinas, Summa Theologiae, uh, uh, Paras 1, one, question 111, but 1. In this stage of her life, does she experience the Holy Spirit as a distinct person or merely as an energeia, as an energy of God? 3.0, the witness of tradition. For instance, Ephraim the Syrian, who died in 373, praises Mary as he meta ten triada panton des moina, in Latin, omnium post. Trinitatem Domina, so after the Trinity, the mistress 
or the leader, the domina of all, the 10th century poet and monk John Geometris, who died in 1000, speaks of her as Deutera tes triados, as the second after the Trinity. In Marian hymns, Mary is congratulated, Gaude Virgo Mater Christi, Quia sola meruisti, o Virgo Piissima, esse tante dignitatis, quod sis sancte trinitatis, sessione proxima. So, in English, rejoice, Virgin, Mother of Christ, because you alone deserved it. O most pious Virgin, that you are of such dignity that you are seated next to the Holy Trinity. Brother Hans of the Lower Rhine in the late 14th century praises Mary, Du bist der Drifultigkeit neist, die alre hoogst, du bist ihr lieb Gesellin rein. That's old German. You are next to the Trinity, the Most High. You are its, the Trinity's dear, pure companion. In the 16th century, Cajetan and Alfonso Salmeron expressed themselves in similar ways. Peter Canisius, who died in 1593, summarizes, quote, the whole of the most holy trinity worked in her. This is not stated about any other person of any saint. Mary is truly the resting place of the whole most holy trinity. Unquote. And then he continues, when we venerate Mary as the mother of God, we honor the whole trinity, the eternal father, to whom we owe it that he, by his omnipotence, used the womb of the virgin to accomplish the great mystery. The great mystery, the son is honored. To his love for us, we owe it that he came from the bosom of the father into the bosom of the virgin. We honor the Holy Spirit because we owe it to his goodness that in Mary, as in a sanctuary, the body of Christ is miraculously conceived and formed. He is a thousandfold wonder, a wonder above all wonders." Unquote. Everyone who ponders what motherhood of God means in such ultimate depth recognizes a human woman, the virgin, who is a mere creature, enters into a most intimate mother-child relationship with the infinite God, close to the second person in the Godhead, and thereby also to the two other persons of the same divine nature. And this is a unique event in the history of creation as it concerns Mary alone. Without a doubt, the dignity of the mother of God does not reach the glory of the hypostatic union in which the holy created humanity of Christ is united with the Logos and thereby also stands in connection with the other divine persons. Therefore, a restricting qualification is required. Mary occupies the first place among the creatures next to the holy humanity of Christ. But it remains true. The motherhood of God is analogous to the hypostatic union from which it issues forth and to which it is similar in spite of its permanent and greater dissimilarity to echo the celebrated statement of the fourth Lateran Council in 1215. Not in the natural order does Mary stand in a special relationship with the Trinity, but in the realm of supernatural life, in the order of grace. She is a creature like all other human beings, and like them called into existence by God. She, different from us via 
Konzept wie Immaculata, the motherhood of God is the starting point and pivot of all her, all her merits. It is the ultimate raison d'être of her extraordinary relations with the divine persons and her superior position vis-à-vis -vis all other creatures. But this divine motherhood is of its own quite unique kind, different from any other motherhood. Here the son is God, towering above his mother in divine greatness has chosen his mother for himself. He has pre-redeemed her, graced her to the highest, likened her to himself, even fashioned her like himself. Thus, Mary lives a spousal God motherhood and is the perfect image of her son. Thus, the great 19th century theologian Matthias Josef Schäben who lived from 1835 until 1888. During the Middle Ages, the title Bride of the Son was often used next to Mother of the Son of God. And the title Sanctuary of the Holy Spirit had enjoyed priority over Bride of the Holy Spirit. There was a preference for a now rare triad daughter of the Father, bride of the Son, sanctuary of the Holy Spirit. In the 19th century, the great Sheben took up again this image. Mary sh shares with us the natural order, but is posited in a special relationship to the Trinity while remaining a creature. Rupert of Deutz, the early 12th century Benedictine monk thus formulates Mary's relationship ships to the Blessed Trinity. Sponsa Patris, Sponsa et Mata Filii, Templum Spiritus Sancti. So, Bride of the Father, Bride and Mother of the Son, Temple of the Holy Spirit. This medieval myst the, the, the medieval mystic Mechthild of Magdeburg states, Bride of the Father, Mother of the Son, Friend, that is beloved, right? Trutine in Old German, of the Holy Spirit, unquote. And other triad has, a lot, has long been familiar to the ears of the faithful. Quote, Daughter of the Father, Mother of the Son, Bride of the Holy Spirit. This is how the 13th century Franciscan Konrad of Saxony already expressed it. Pater cuius Maria est filia nobilissima, filius cuius est mata dignisis, dignissima, spiritus sanctus cuius est sponsa venustissima. So in English, um, the father who, who is the most noble, whose she is the most noble daughter, the son whose mother is the most worthy, the Holy Spirit, whose bride is the most beautiful. Similar is the language of Conrad of Heimburg. In his radio address to the Portuguese people on May 13, 1946, Pope Pius XII praises Mary in Portuguese as filia primogenita do padre e madre estremosa do verbo e esposa predilecta do Espirito Santo, the firstborn, do the firstborn daughter of the Father, the blessed mother of the Word, and the blessed spouse of the Holy Spirit. Vatican II prefers the phrase mother of the Son of God, by which account she is also the beloved daughter of the Father and the temple of the Holy Spirit. 4.0. Uh, St. Paul VI writes, 1974, in the apostolic letter Signum Magnum, nor is it to be feared that the greater veneration, liturgical as well as private, given to her can obscure or diminish the adoration which is offered to the incarnate word. 
as well as to the Father and to the Holy Spirit. It continues that Mary enjoys the contemplation of the Most Holy Trinity. She pays the highest honor to the Most Holy Trinity. In this sober, in the more sober apostolic exhortation, Marialis Cultus, which is concerned with theological and liturgical accuracy, St. Paul VI states, in the first place, it is supremely fitting that exercises of piety directed towards the Virgin Mary should clearly express the nulta bene, Trinitarian and Christological note that is intrinsic and essential to them. Christian worship, in fact, is of itself worship offered to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, or, as liturgy puts it, to the Father through Christ in the Spirit." Unquote. Already earlier, Pius XII, in a radio address in 1954, um, had already described Mary as belonging to the family of the Trinity. The same pope, in the radio address to the Mariological Congress in Rome, following Thomas Aquinas, declares the dignity of the Mother of God is in a certain, case, is in a certain sense infinite. In a 1931 encyclical, Lux Veritatis, his predecessor, Pius XI, had observed that the Theotokos is Summa post deum dignitas, the highest in dignity after God. What the, the ecclesiastical magisterium states in general about Mary's proximity to the Trinity and her dignity lies in the line of the preceding tradition. St. John Paul II, in the apostolic le letter Mulieris Dignitatem, comments, quote, the self-revelation of God, the inscrutable unity of Trinity is contained in its essential features in the Annunciation at Nazareth." Unquote. The corresponding footnote 16 reads, quote, already with the fathers of the church, the first revelation of the Trinity occurred at the Annunciation. Unquote. The Pope refers to St. Gregory, the wonder worker, and to St. Andrew of Crete. Toward the end of number three, he, St. John Paul II, states, quote, who of them, that is the daughters of the chosen people, however, could have foreseen that the promised Messiah would be the Son of the Most High? Seen from the perspective of Old Testament monothe monotheism, this was hardly imaginable. By virtue of the Holy Spirit alone, who overshadowed her, was Mary able to accept what is impossible for men, but possible for God. Mark 10, 27, namely the recognition of the Blessed Trinity, unquote. Theologians take the understanding of the Blessed Trinity as it emerges not only from Scripture, but also from tradition guided by the magisterium of the Church, and assume in Mary, who is nevertheless more than a mere simple Jewish girl, special illuminations, even a scientia infusa, at particularly significant sta stages of the Blessed Virgin's life. The Dominican theologian teaching at Louvain, Belgium, Benedictus Henricus Merkelbach summarizes still in Latin, Beata Virgo accipere debuit cognitionem de iis omnibus que pertinent ad eus dignitatem et munus matris dei. In English, the Blessed Virgin should have recognized, or received, pardon me, should have received knowledge of all that pertains to her dignity and role as the mother of God. And then he mentions especially knowledge of the mystery of the most holy trinity at the moment of the incarnation of the Son of God. One must energetically agree with scholars who place Mary at the head of the mystical, mystically gifted souls whose interior life is ex 
experientially Trinitarian, in view of the greatness and dignity of the Mother of God, it is natural to place the beginning of such a profound mystical contemplative life at the incarnation of the Son of God. Does it not follow from this that the mystery of the Trinity is imparted to the Mother of God at her reception of the angelic message? The most intimate union of Mary with the Trinity, according to the general doctrine of grace, the gratia creata, the sanctifying grace, the grace of sonship with God, of divine life, is accompanied with the gratia increata. While the gratia creata means likeness to God, the gratia increata means attachment to God. That is special closeness to God, intimacy with God. In the Middle Ages, we often encounter the title Trinitatis Triclinium, for the Mother of God. It means literally seat camp for three, reclining couch for meal, and is therefore already in this literal sense very suitable for the designation of Mary as the dwelling place of three divine persons. This is expressed by Hugh of St. Victor, or Adam of St. Victor, in his sequence on the Feast of the Nativity of Mary, Salve Mater Salvatoris, in the famous verse, Salve Mater Pietatis et Totius Trinitatis Nubile Triclinium. Salve, Mother of Piety, and noble seat of the complete Trinity. Tellingly, this verse is also under Fra Angelicus' 15th century painting in the cloister of San Marco in Florence and is already cited in the 12th century, Libellus de Corona Virginis, among the works of St. Ildefonsus, that is 7th century notabene, right? He died in 677. Likewise, it is mentioned in various passages of Albert the Great. Thomas Aquinas deduces from the greeting Dominus Tecum with the angel addressing Mary, Mary's special closeness with the triune God. He writes, Familiarior cum Deo est Beata Virgo, quam Angelus quia cum Ipsa Dominus Pater, Dominus Filius, Dominus Spiritus Sanctus, Tuta Trinitatis, et idio cantatur de ea, totius Trinitatis nobile triclinium, hoc autem verbum, dominus tecum, est nobilius verbum, quod sibi dici posit. In, in English, the Blessed Virgin is more familiar with God than an angel because she is with the Lord, the Father, the Lord, the Son, the Lord, the Holy Spirit, the whole Trinity, that is. And that is why it is sung about her, totius triclinium, perfect seat of the noble seat. Now this word, the Lord is with you, is a nobler word than that can be said to him. In similar language, Conrad of Saxony speaks of Mary's familiarity with the dignity, with, with regard to dig, with dignity. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs>we have time uh, perhaps for one question. Is there any question from the audience? There's a microphone in the back. Please feel free to step up to the microphone if you'd like to ask Father de Gaulle a question or make a comment. So triclinium is an old Latin word. It means simply the bench, the seat, or divan on which people would lie, acubare in Latin, anakaimai, in Greek and enjoy leisure, maybe at an impluvium. I, uh, 
Father, thank you. Um, I know the topic was the Trinity and Mary, uh, but as a husband and father, I find myself drawn to meditate on the life of St. Joseph and his role in the Holy Family to draw closer to the Trinity. Do you, do you have any thoughts or reflections on the Trinity and St. Joseph? Well, <laughs> <laughs> our great hero, St. Joseph, was mute <laughs> during the New Testament, right? We, he never spoke. So we can say the following. We have theologically a hierarchy of truths. They're interconnected. So, of course, the Blessed Trinity is the primary truth. The Incarnation is the primary truth. And then Mary is something like the secondary truth. And I would say St. Joseph, without insulting him, is maybe a tertiary truth. Because the Immaculate Conception is reserved to Mary, right? So there is a prioritization, but I, cannot, I, can, I can only speculate in what way he knew about the Trinity, right? This would be very difficult, right? I, I guess the, the context for me was uh, St. Joseph as chosen by God to be the husband of Mary and the earthly father of, of, of Jesus, and then... Um, gifted with the virtues and guided by the Holy Spirit during his time. Right, and right. I would say it would be maybe stretching to say that he was in any way aware of the Blessed Trinity, in Kuwaitly, right, even. But what we can say is that what he did not know was precisely the chance for his greatness, namely his trusting in the ever greater possibilities of God, like Abraham did. Father Degal, thank you very much for that presentation. Thank you.